everybody, Dr. Rob Silverman here, Proven Health Alternatives. I am with two esteemed colleagues. I've got Dr. Chad Werlner and my friend, Dr. Andrew. Guys, how's it going? Awesome. Going Thanks great. for having us, Rob. Uh, it's my pleasure. I mean, I know we're going to light it on fire. So we're going to talk about mitochondria and mitochondria's impact on functional medicine. As we all know, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Mitochondria are the driver of all physiological activity. Mitochondria and the energy they produce play an integral role in health and disease. Mitochondrial function is akin to the amount of the pressure the foot puts on the pedal. So the further you go down, the more gas you burn, the more ATP you use up, but the more exhaust. We believe, and I hardly agree with this, that mitochondrial function is now the new window into functional medicine. And you guys have been doing a lot of studying and you have your a course. And I wanted to set you guys up and let you roll with that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, we our program, Simplified Functional Medicine, which our, our big announcement, Andrew just learned today, we are officially trademarked. Is that right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> we officially, the term Simplified Functional Medicine is now ours. We, we own it. Um, no, uh, that's been, it's, it's funny that you say that. And I loved how you put that, Rob, that like, that's the window, because that seems to be the... Um, common denominator, so to speak, or kind of the, the, the fundamental kind of connection between so many different chronic illnesses. Um, you know, I've kind of gone down this rabbit hole for the past month or so where I literally will type in a condition and then studies on mitochondrial dysfunction with, you know, whatever thyroid issues, joint issues, inflammation, autoimmune, you know, you name it. And more likely or more often than not, you're going to find studies supporting and, and connecting those dots that some way or another, and it should make total sense, right? The fact that, that if, if the mitochondria is producing energy, we have to ask the question, you know, let, let's take, for instance, chronic inflammation, you know, inflammation is a natural response. The body is responding normally to whatever the insult or issue is with inflammation. That's its way of kind of cleaning up messes, right? So then all of a sudden when acute inflammation transitions into kind of chronic inflammation, the question we ask is why didn't that inflammation get resolved? Why didn't, you know, because normally in a normal inflammatory response, you've got the, you know, acute portion and then all of a sudden then the body will then send in the cleanup crew the pro resolving mediators and kind of settle things down. But when it becomes chronic, we have to ask the question why. And some people will just say, well, it's just because they continue to eat a poor diet or, and that's true. That, that, that's part of it. I, I understand that lifestyle is a huge component to that. But what you find lurking in the background is the fact that it's an energy problem is the fact that, that you're putting too much demand on the body and the mitochondria is being overwhelmed in essence is what's happening. And so you start to see that, that if we can address uh, the energy, you know, equation or part of the part of the equation, we start to really, really help the body kind of get back to normal state. And and what really kind of opened my eyes to this was when you look at like osteoarthritis. Um, they're finding that 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 in and of itself, what's driving that is a an energy production crisis or an energy production problem. You you address the mitochondria, you address energy there, you're going to address a lot of that. Um, kind of chronic inflammation. What were you going to say, Andrew? Sorry. I wasn't going to say anything. Oh, I agree. We're just going. Yeah. You know, I, it, with, uh, with our program, what we teach docs and patients through simplified functional medicine and our, and our, all of our patient facing stuff, what we like to do and, and think is valuable is to try to simplify the conversation that, you know, we're talking about chronic health issues and we're talking about human physiology. It gets really complex real fast. Whether you're talking about body issues, brain issues, I would even say spiritual issues, like you can dive down some some rabbit holes when talking about health. And we've noticed that in in our studies and what we're finding in, in our experiences with patients is that there's often these common denominators that that span really any health, any chronic health issue. And you know, there's um, we, we've quoted before uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, and we've we've you know, and and there's there's beauty and simplicity, there's sophistication and simplicity, and and also there's you know there's Occam's razor, which is a, this philosophy when you're dealing with complex topics and complex theories where there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of uh, what we call rabbit holes. Oftentimes, 
the simplest explanations are the correct explanations. And we find that mitochondria fits the bill. So whether you're talking about brain health issues, uh, autoimmune issues, inflammation, you know, chronic inflammation issues, there's always mitochondria at play. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put this together. This may sound, make me sound really stupid, but um, you know, we all learned in sixth grade biology that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And then we know that the nucleus is the control center of the cell. And what we now realize is that's not really true. It's actually a little bit different. The, the, the nucleus doesn't really control the cell. It houses DNA information, much like a library. So the, the nucleus has all the DNA and all the, the sort of the hard wiring in the cell for what that cell is supposed to do. But it's the mitochondria that are actually working and, and, and performing the operations, not only intracellular, intracellularly, but also intracellularly, can't say that word, um, operating between you know cell to cell communication. And so mitochondria is kind of like the librarian where they're checking out books from, from the nucleus and they're doing all the work. They're checking in, checking out books, working with the customers and the, the people in the, in the library and they're doing all the work. And so it's much more than energy production and you know, converting food and oxygen into ATP for energy. Uh, mitochondria are working uh, to drive immunity and then working in, uh, with the immune system. They're working with pretty much every single pathway in physiology, mitochondria is, is there. And so we've been, we've been really geeking out on this subject and talking a lot about it. And, and also what we can do to really help, like what, how does this make sense to patients? What do we do with this information? Okay, so mitochondria is a big deal. Great, what do we do with that? How do you measure it? Then how do you influence it in a way to correct chronic health issues? Outstanding, ton ton pack there. So let's go through some of the functions of mitochondria. Number one, it produces cellular ATP powerhouse of the cell, big check mark. So when that's inefficient, what's the number one complaint that most uh, patients see coming to the doctor? Fatigue. Number two, and this is a hidden one. You guys touched on it. There's an important role that mitochondria plays in the apoptosis and the program cell death. So the mm. cell death is slow or if you will, inflammaging, because as Chad said, inflammation lasts too long. It doesn't allow the cells to die. They become senescent cells, ultimately into zombie cells. And therefore it's inflammaging, which is obviously one of the top things that we talk about when we, when we cover the subject of longevity. And lastly, it's got a vast number of tentacles throughout the bodies. So in that, what are your suggestions for people who have some mitochondria dysfunctions? Are there any tests? Are there any uh, protocols that you'd like to share with them so people can have a Monday morning takeaway? Uh, yeah, so great, great question. Um, one of the, you know, one of the ways, for, well, first of all, before we get into testing, I think there is, there is, you know, just looking at health history, you can discover a lot. You mentioned one, uh, Dr. Silverman, energy levels. So if your energy levels are poor, that's a that's a key sign that you may have metabolic issues or mitochondrial dysfunction. So you can, can do a lot with just that. Um, if you look at insulin sensitivity, there's another great sign. So that's an easy to do test that'll show you if you have potentially some metabolic dysfunction going on. Um, and there's a lot to unpack just with that one thing alone. Um, Mental health is a big one. So if you look at pretty much any mental health issue, depression, anxiety, OCD, sleep issues from just health history, that's another good sign. So we, we kind of take, and we've talked, I think we've talked about this before, uh, we take the position of less testing is, is better. Um, you can do lots of different tests and probably find lots of different markers for, for mitochondria. But I, I say, I, I really think health history is a big one. Um, in terms of testing. Yeah, the, the other one that we look at a lot that we connect the dots to from just a, again, simplicity and the most natural approach possible is we look at the connection between circadian rhythm or biological rhythm and mitochondrial function. There's a very intimate connection between your sleep-wake cycle and mitochondrial function. In fact, mitochondria are just intimately tied to that. There have been numerous studies that have connected those dots. And so we look at total cortisol output. We look at your cortisol rhythm as a window into circadian rhythm. And so for us, then that, that being, okay, that's the test. And obviously I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but then the next logical question is if people's circadian rhythm is off, if their biological rhythm is kind of faulty in that sense, some of the most natural medicine that we can quote unquote give them is sunlight and darkness, right? I.e. 
improving their wake cycle when they're awake, improving their sleep cycle when they need to be sleeping. Those two fundamental things that, that I think oftentimes, much like diet and exercise, get a lot of lip service but not a lot of like real world implementable strategies. Again, people will just throw stuff out. Well, try melatonin at night and, you know, valerian root and, and make sure you, you know, all this stuff, but no real like hardcore tangible strategies. How do you actually, what does that look like in terms of systemization? What does that look like in terms of, uh, you know, a, a real framework? And that's one of the things we do in our program is we give a system, we give a framework, we give a morning routine and an evening routine that are easy to follow that can be adaptable to the patient, that can easily be, uh, that, that sets them up for consistency so they can experience some wins. But I, I get a little ahead of myself going back to that question in terms of testing, kind of what Andrew said. When we look at, at some simple testing that gives us a window into the overall function uh, and, and with health history, that's one of the things, one of the first questions I'll ask people, you know, to, to just determine whether or not things are right or not, is I'll ask people, are you a morning person? And nine out of 10 people are going to say, no, I'm not a morning person, right? That is a dead giveaway that there's problems with mitochondria because we are hardwired to be morning people. That's the way, you know what I mean? We're all biologically wired, but if we're not identifying as quote unquote morning people, that's a dead giveaway that you've got some level of dysfunction with mitochondria on some level or another. So... Yeah, it's funny that you say the morning person. One of the questions I ask is, do you need that second cup of coffee in that afternoon or that right. next dose? Because coffee yeah. is usually accompanied by increased mitochondria activity. So that's a great takeaway as opposed to, you know, giving them a litany of tests, just simply check their energy level because mitochondria is yeah. where metabolism happens. But when your mitochondria isn't working properly, your metabolism isn't as efficient. And how could you lose weight or thrive in life without efficient mitochondria? So I get yeah. a lot of questions on mitochondria function. What kind of lifestyle hacks should somebody do? You know, obviously we're not looking for drugs and we'll hit the supplements and things of that nature. What kind of lifestyle hacks, foods, intermittent fasting, softball, um, yeah. exercise, <laughs> stuff like well, that. There's, there's, some, there's some really simple ones that we incorporate into our program with our patients. Um, well, can I, can you, before, you, before you do that, just kind of set that up. I think I know where Chad's going with this. This is this is like the, the crux with mitochondrial dysfunction is that when somebody has this and they're tired and they're fatigued and they don't have energy, when when we suggest it's not like the doctor's like, oh, Chad, no big deal. So you, you have energy issues. Well, we just need you to clean up your diet and need you to move more. And the problem with that, from a lifestyle perspective, those are two very difficult things for people to do. And so oftentimes when they can't change, like let's take nutrition for an example. We all know that changing and cleaning up your diet has an impact on your health, but that requires that you grocery shop, you meal plan, you make food, you make a grocery list, um, you get your family on board, and then you actually eat things that sometimes don't jive with your palate. And so it requires for a lot more, of for more than one meal for one. Yeah. So it, it requires energy to do that. And so when we ask our patients like, Hey, just clean up your diet. And then they don't, they fail in two weeks and like, what you, you, you fell off the wagon. Why? And like, I just couldn't stick to it. And we oftentimes we're quick to judge like, ah, oh, they're just lazy or they just weren't disciplined or they just don't get it. Like yeah, if they don't want it bad enough. Yeah. They don't want it bad enough. And, and, and what, what we say in a lot of cases, it's not that they're lazy. It's just that they literally don't have the energy to make those changes happen in their life with all the other things that are happening at the same time. And so what we we coach a lot of docs to do is like, don't start there. That's that's maybe a, a month, two, month, three, month, four, four goal. Start with something that is easy to do, that you'll get good compliance with, but that also moves the needle in terms of energy production. Chad mentioned this before. This gets overlooked really often. How hard is it to just go outside in the morning and expose yourself to sunlight. Maybe difficult in the winter, but even the laziest person in the world with low energy can, can hobble outside in their robe and slippers and just stand outside and, and, you know, and look up at the sky. That's, e that's easy to do. Um, going to bed on time, that's, I would argue that some, for some people that's tough to do with, you know, they binge watch TV and things like that, but doesn't require a lot of energy to, to brush your teeth and flop down in your bed and go to sleep at a decent hour. Those are two things that require very little energy but move the needle and make a big impact in terms of energy production. So let's say you do that for a month. You go outside, you, you got your, your light and your darkness dialed in. 
So for some people, that makes a huge difference in, in energy levels. Now that's a habit that's established. Now you can start talking about things that require a little bit more energy and focus. So maybe now we start talking about um, doing a morning routine. So what is that? So now you've gone outside. How about incorporating a little bit of movement with sunlight exposure? So that could be going for a walk for 15 minutes instead of just gazing up at the sky. And I'm using some kind of funny examples here, but um, let's go for a 10 minute walk. Let's do some stretching. Um, movement in the morning helps establish normal circadian and hormonal pat patterns, especially done first thing in the morning. So we start to kind of stack these different, what we call, you know, their therapies or, or just lifestyle things. These are some really simple things that almost anybody can do that starts to help raise the production and the efficiency of mitochondria before jumping into what I would call the harder things, you know, the, the fitness and, and, and nutrition. Yeah, and two others kind of similar yin and yang uh, principles for mitochondrial function, like light and dark, would be heat and cold exposure. And there are ways to ease into that, right? Everybody's, it's becoming like, I can't turn on Facebook or Instagram now without seeing somebody selling their cold plunge system. Uh, I'd like to think that we were way ahead of the curve on that. We, uh, we got involved with a company called Ice Barrel. So quick shout out to uh, Wyatt Ewing, the CEO of Ice Barrel. He's a good buddy of ours. And uh, I have, we both have ice barrels and we've been using those for a while. That's been proven to be an effective strategy for uh, increasing uh, mitochondrial uh, genesis and 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 uh, production and function, uh, as well as heat exposure. Um, but for those who are like, man, I would never do a polar plunge. I would never jump in an ice barrel or anything like that. There's a simple way that anybody could do at a threshold that will start to move the needle, like Andrew said, and that is ending your showers on cold. So, so you do your normal morning shower in the last 30 seconds on cold, as cold as you can stand it, do that for 30 days. You know, and while you're doing that, just breathe deeply and go through that process. Heat exposure as well. So get get to a sauna, go to, go to a gym that has a sauna, do regular sauna exposure. That's going to be something that'll help as well. So those those two kind of, again, you've got your light, your dark, your heat, your cold. You've got your intermittent fasting, which doesn't, I think people misunderstand with intermittent fasting. There are a variety of different ways to do it but it doesn't have to be that difficult. I mean, you could simply like, if you want the dummies guide to intermittent fasting, don't eat breakfast until 10 AM and then close your window by 6 PM. And that's like, you're okay. When, when people hear it that way, they're like, I can do that. I can end dinner at six. Don't eat anything. Don't eat anything else um, by then right? or, or at that time, end it there. So that basically what three hours from six, you know, your body's done kind of digesting, done its thing. So basically you're fasting from that window of 9 p.m. approximately to 10 a.m. So that's what an 11 hour window is my math right there. 99 would be 12 hours, right? Or no, nine to 13 hours, right? Nine to 10 would be 13 hours, I think, right? Anyways, but yeah, so if, there you if go. If you didn't eat breakfast today, you'd be able to do that math a lot faster in your head. That's right, that's true, that's true, <laughs> yeah. No, uh, but but yeah, intermittent fasting again is a, is a solid way to, to improve. So these are all just in terms of lifestyle things uh, and, and simplicity, this is just incredibly low hanging fruit for, you know, and, and these are all adaptable strategies. That's the nice thing too, for patients is this is all stuff that can be relatively, um, modified and adapted to even people at, the, at like the lowest, lowest level possible for, to make it, you know, easy layups for people. The hot cold that you were just talking about, uh, the intermittent fasting that falls under the concept of hormesis where you strain yeah. the body a little bit and that body's got to respond. So it's a great takeaway in that the liver is going to produce both heat and cold shock proteins. And that's really going to imbue your ability to get that mitochondria to function well. The, and, and I know it's what Chad was saying about the intermittent fasting. I'm going to even break it down even more granular for, for everybody. Number one, do not eat any food in the first hour that you wake up, only water. Hour two, you can have black coffee. And the reason for black coffee in hour two is you guys said, great, when you wake up, you have cortisol and that gives you energy to go. Coffee can st stimulate too much cortisol in the morning and it can also stimulate protein synthesis. So get your black coffee in hour two and don't eat three hours before you go to sleep. Intermittent fasting is great for mitochondria health because it pro provides a process called autophagy, won a 2016 Nobel Prize. It's the breakdown of old cells and you're allowed to have new cells that does function at the mitochondrial level. They call that mitophagy. 
So what you guys were sharing, a low level intermittent fast, which is great. You know, these people who want one meal a day, no bueno, or, you know, eat in a six hour window where they get one meal and a snack, they're not getting enough protein and protein is critical for overall health and protein leads to muscle mass, which is our longevity organ. So the whole point to feel robust is to have enough muscle mass and allow that mitochondria to function well. And lastly, on intermittent fasting, not trying to go to the 50,000 foot view, it stimulates an antioxidant pathway, NRF2. So one of the things about mitochondrial function is the more that you produce ATP, the more exhaust of the body, reactive oxygen species, by stimulating the NRF2, it knocks down the ROS. So now you not only have mitochondria functioning well, you have so no negative effects to trying and push the gas pedal of life down. So you guys really encapsulated everything. That said, I'm sure we're going to have some questions. Are there any supplements that you guys would recommend to help with mitochondrial function? Yeah, there, there are a lot. I would say before I go into that, if I can, one other thing that I don't want to overlook, we would be grossly missing the mark if we, if we missed this one. And that is, and this is going to sound totally wacko to people, but you can actually think uh, more mitochondria. You can think mitochondrial function to improve it. Uh, there's studies showing meditation will help improve mitochondrial function. And so it's literally like you can use your mind over matter to create. And, and that's the thing. One of the, one of the big messages too, that I would say before we get into supplementation, this kind of is a good segue into supplementation is I think one of our big contentions in the world of functional medicine is that unintentionally it has created a state of disempowerment with people because there's such an emphasis on lab testing and supplementation being the crux or the secret. And so what that does is that kind of pushes away the kind of personal empowerment aspects of functional medicine, when in reality, the real things that drive the needle is the human body itself, that, that, the, the fundamental principle that chiropractors have espoused since day one is this vitalistic model that healing comes from the inside, that our bodies are innately designed to be self-healing and self-regulating, and we should not dismiss that. And yet it gets dismissed, I think, way too easily, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we know that in theory that that's this theoretical premise and whatnot, and, and we need to understand that's not theory, that's reality, you know? And not only that, but uh, I've been geeking out on this new book that I um, heard about called The Expectation Effect. And it literally shows in science, it, it goes through, and it, it, there have been several others that I've read too. Another one by, I um, can't remember his name, but the book is called Suggestible You. And, and a lot of these books really show this whole idea. Uh, the other one is The Upside of Stress by Kelly McGonigal. You talked about hormesis. And she talks about how the, the studies that have been done have been really clear that to say that stress is bad for you is kind of missing the mark. It's your perception of the stress that you're under that makes all the difference in the world. They've done studies showing that people who feel like they're, they're under a lot of stress and that's a bad thing, have a lower, shorter life expectancy. Those who have stress, but view it as like, it's a challenge, I'm up for the challenge. This is gonna prime me, this is gonna make me stronger those people have longer life expectancies and shouldn't be surprising. The longest us. life expectancy. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so um, before we dive into supplements and, and, and those recommendations, it's just important to understand the right kind of mental perspective because your, your mindset, uh, and, and we're going to incorporate and include meditation as part of that whole process, um, makes all the difference in the world in terms of mitochondrial function. I, in fact, I would say that probably is the biggest because you literally if, if you're doing all these things right now if they listen to this podcast and they're taking copious notes and be like okay these are the things that i'm going to do and they genuinely believe that they've been given kind of the keys to the kingdom so to speak in terms of health and longevity and they perceive in their mind like these are the secrets and they're going to actually do it with that positive mindset mentality guess what's going to happen? It's going to, it's going to literally physiologically make a difference in terms of the positive impact versus somebody who's like, this is nonsense. I'll do it, but it's probably not going to make a difference. Nothing works for me. And they take that kind of negative mindset. 
like we, we are like literally walking self-fulfilling prophecies in terms of human beings we're wired that way and i can't overemphasize that enough that's i've seen that in my life i've seen that in so many patients lives and the same goes for supplements if you take the supplements and you perceive and believe that those supplements are going to make a positive impact because I've seen the research on it. I've heard about this supplement company. This is a reputable source. They source them the right way. They do good research. It's clean, blah, 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 blah. And you like really perceive these are the right supplements. Um, they will have studies show this. They have a better, more positive and profound impact on the body versus these are sketchy supplements. I'm not too sure about this. They're probably contaminated. I'm probably taking too much. This is probably going to interact with medications and or supplements I'm already taking. You know, it's like you're you're setting yourself up for, you know, problems, you know, there. And so that's not to say that supplements don't matter, that there are studies and, and research behind supplements. But anyways, Andrew, supplements. I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one. And this is this is a funny little sorry, short, funny story. So I'm visiting Chad in Boise, Idaho. And as we're, uh, Jason, our other partner, Jason is here as well. And we forgot like some of our supplements that we use. And so Chad's like, well, we're going to go to my supplement store. It's called Jack's Nutrition. J-A-X. J-A-X. Shout out to Jack's Nutrition. This is a bodybuilder's paradise. And so when you go and look at all the labels of the supplements, they sound more like fireworks than they may be <laughs> like healthy nutritional supplements. And it's like, there's some funny labels on there. But um, one that I picked up yesterday. Maximum Warfare. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. But one of them I picked up yesterday was creatine. Um, I haven't used creatine in a long, long time. And I was just reading some studies that creatine is awesome for ATP production. It's awesome for mental clarity and brain function. It's really good for just energy production overall. Weightlifters, weightlifters have known this for a long time. Um, there has been a negative connotation to creatine that it could cause you know, kidney and liver issues. But I think now it's the most studied uh, supplement ever, I think. And what the studies are showing is it's very safe and you can use that as like a, hey, a quick way to, to supplement uh, your energy production. And if that's something that you're looking to, to, to do. Um, yeah, creatine, another not from a, not to interrupt you, creatine, I wrote my thesis yeah. on creatine. So you got it. The update is oh, fabulous really? on creatine. Yeah. Twice. So, wow. um, cause my goal was to do nothing but look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Thank God I haven't sounded like him. I have my own unique <laughs> sound. <laughs> so, um, Creatine, I, I want to piggyback on what you said, make ATP, five grams a day, no loading phase, and also great for short and long-term brain memory uh, reactivation. So I want to toss the ball back to you. Remember, guys, I play point guard, so I passed that ball around a little bit. There you go. Yeah. Well, I didn't, I didn't realize I was talking to the creatine man. So yeah. Um, so that's a really simple one. We We take a slightly different approach to... Um, from a supplement standpoint, surprise, surprise. Um, we want to know, okay, if mitochondrial dysfunction is the what? So I have, my, I have metabolic issues. We want to know why. Why do you have it? And what we, we feel strongly is that stress is usually the, the upstream cause of mitochondrial dysfunction. Stress in all of its forms, mental and emotional, chemical stressors, and physical stressors. When you have those stressors on your body, it has a direct impact on your energy energy production. So from a supplement standpoint, we look at, like Chad mentioned earlier, circadian rhythms. We look at the HPA axis. Uh, we look a lot at that because your HPA axis is your body's, one of your body's main stress coping mechanisms, coping systems. So from a, from a feedback loop system, okay, your brain senses stress, mental, emotional, physical, chemical. It sends a cascade of hormones uh, through your body. And that is designed to fight or flee the stress. And mitochondrial dysfunction is that the sort of the um, uh, is affected uh, negatively by by that by chronic stress. And so we we use supplements, we use bioidentical hormones to help balance the HPA axis response. Um, so we use we'll use things like uh, pregnenolone, DHEA, licorice root, phosphatidylserine to kind of balance the circadian rhythms of of. Uh, stress response hormones reset that rhythm yeah so using supplements kind of reset uh, and sort of rehardwire that body's response not to eliminate the stress but be to become more resilient to stress so if your hp access is responding more adequately to those stresses what we find is that mitochondrial uh, your mitochondria have a much easier time regulating themselves 
Yeah. I, an, another kind of new kid on the block, so to speak, it's probably not that new, but but I think a lot more attention is getting focused on it is fulvic and humic acid derived supplements. Uh, predominantly, I think the leader in this space right now, everybody's really, really excited about is Cellcore. Cellcore supplements uh, are just really awesome in terms of helping to eliminate toxic burdens at a cellular level. And so what that's doing is that's helping uh, improve mitochondrial function from the standpoint of if we can remove some of that toxic burden at the cellular level, you can enhance and improve uh, mitochondrial function uh, in terms of that, what you were talking about, that inter and intracellular communication to improve that. And so I think there's some really good research that's come out uh, showing fulvic and humic acid derived supplementation can help with mitochondrial function as well. So I would just give a shout out to Cellcore in that regard. Yeah. And then, and then finally, this is not a supplement for, but uh, in terms of equipment and technology, uh, low level laser therapy is a big one. So this is one when you're talking yeah. about, yeah, our, our friends at Ericonia would be really upset if we didn't talk about laser therapy. Right. So what the heck? Guys? Come on, <laughs> yeah. We really teed that up. Uh, yeah, that's so the different wavelengths uh, of light can can uh, directly impact energy and ATP production. Through the yeah, and, and the thing the thing that I want to piggyback on that is, you know, I, I almost have to downplay to a certain extent the lasers because we see such incredible and almost miraculous results with them and such far reaching almost to the point that it almost sounds like a panacea. Lasers will do everything and anything. And, and the reality of it is, is if it seems that way, I think there's a far more plausible and science-based explanation behind it because we're going so far upstream with the overall rationale and strategy of why we're using the lasers in the first place. If the lasers truly are impacting the mitochondria and specifically impacting them on that electron transport chain, which I believe uh, personally, this is just Chad Wilner speaking, and I think, again, Berconia would be back me up on this in terms of what they're seeing in terms of studies. I think that's only one piece of the puzzle as to what lasers are physiologically doing. I think there are other things that physiologi physiologically speaking that we just haven't even scratched the surface on. I think that's the, the lowest hanging fruit in terms of what the science seems to be showing. I think there are other mechanisms at, at play physiologically, biochemically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, that are happening, but it just so happens that the one that we can measurably see right now is mitochondria and specifically that electron transport chain, those four complexes that are being impacted by the different wavelengths of light. And um, th that's why you see such broad reaching because where, where isn't there mitochondria throughout the body? What cells don't have mitochondria? Just about all cells uh, have in some way or another. And so you know, you impact uh, a, a mitoc mitochondria in a muscle cell that's going to have a positive impact on muscle. In a nerve cell, it's going to have a positive impact on the nerve. In a brain cell, in the brain, in bone cells, in the bone, you know, it's like, and so on and so forth, you know. And so that's why you see all these just broad reaching effects and impacts is because it's such a fundamental root level that you're addressing there. And so you get all these just incredible downstream effects. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I love when you guys talk about the complexes, the four complexes. Interestingly enough, new article that just came out, the number one reason for mitochondrial complex deficiency, which is really what we're talking about, is complex one not functioning. And the 405 wavelength is the one that stimulates that complex and starts that mitochondria cascade. Studies have shown that lasers with low level power and specific wavelength, like you mentioned, 405, 520, 635, are able to have what we call an electromagnetic transfer of energy and stimulate that mitochondrial function going through that electron transport chain. Those that are a little larger in a wavelength don't have enough electron volts. And so therefore they don't stimulate the chain and they kind of provide a heat to the area which we all know very well is in most instances deleterious to structures and soft tissue. And lastly, what you said about the other physiological things to tie it up in a nice tight bow that laser does is laser actually turns on interleukin 10, which is an anti-inflammatory interleukin, which has the capability of shutting off a lot of pro-inflammatory interleukins, like one beta, one beta, I should say, 
six, eight, and TNF alpha. So in this little um, Star Trek-y cell phone kind of thing, we're able to get great revolutionary changes. We just almost want to downplay them because people will think that we're crazy because of the quick change. And if you've ever been treated by a laser and you get a quick change in strength, pain, range of motion, it's because of that mitochondrial function that's able to be in cascade through those four complexes. As far as the supplements, I'm just going to hit you with two additional ones. I think you guys did a great job. And I love the idea that you want to just slowly put the body back into its path of healing. Probably the two that come to mind most for me are L-carnitine. It's the most mitochondrial structured functional marker. It's great for getting that energy. And also the most studied enzyme is coenzyme Q10. It's the number mm -hmm. one nutrient in the heart. And unfortunately, when people take certain drugs like a statin, they strip their mitochondria of coenzyme Q10. So those would be the two. And the food that I would tell everybody to avoid if they could, or the macronutrient would be sugar. Sugar is detrimental to most people's overall health. Sugar is dirty fuel for the mitochondria. Fats and proteins are clean fuels. So Buddy the Elf is going to be disappointed with that last one. Buddy the Elf. <laughs> That's right. Sugar and syrup? <laughs> then yes. <laughs> you said syrup. It's sticky, right? Yes. Yeah. So carbohydrates stick to your arteries. That's what they call glycation. And that's why hemoglobin A1C is so damaging. But again, you know, let's not get me wound up and let the jack out of the box. Let's dig in on mitochondria. So we, we've talked about lifestyle. We've talked about modalities. We've talked about some macronutrients. You've, you've talked about the idea of sleep and circadian rhythm. Um, can you go in a little bit more detail on how that circadian rhythm is affected by a lifestyle and what the circadian rhythm does to align the body in a healing um, light? Yeah, that, that there was that study. I think, I don't know if we were recording or if this was pre-podcast banter or whatever, but melatonin has a, a really positive impact on mitochondrial function. And of course, uh, nighttime and or absence of light is when the body via the pineal gland will release that melatonin. And, uh, and so some of the most, again, simple and or low hanging fruit examples of things that we can do at nighttime is eliminating blue light. You know, so if you're like, I can't not do that. I have to do for whatever reason, which I think most people can, but get blue blocking glasses. You can buy a pair on Amazon for 20 bucks or whatever, um, eliminate uh, EMFs in your room as best you can um, and or you can invest in some simple EMF blocking technology there's a variety of them out there we bought this company I bought a it's a, a bag <laughs> it's gonna sound funny uh, a bag of rocks EMF rocks um, they were a sponsor at a cell core event and those have been studied to be able to block out uh, harmful EMFs um, just electronic exposure, get rid of that um, before bed, making sure your room environment is, is adequately prepared, uh, both in terms of light uh, as well as body temperature. Um, one of my favorite pieces of technology that I invested in several years ago is called uh, the Chili Pad by a company called Sleep Me. Um, they, they make these pads that are water cooled or water warm, depending upon how you want it, and you can customize it. But um, it's especially in the summertime, it's amazing. Oh, that's have, the best. Oh, yeah. I have a nice cool pad that I sleep on. And that helps to induce uh, a temperature that really is conducive to a deeper sleep. And I've noticed that since using that, my sleep is just way, way better. I know there are certain mattresses that now have that technology. There's like the Sleep 8 or whatever. I haven't used that. I've just used the, the chili pad and I've loved it. It's awesome. And so uh, that's been helpful. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, one of the other simple tools that we use um, is um, two, two tools that we'll use with our patients is number one, um, delta or not delta waves, uh, binaural beats, binaural beats to help get the brain into a deeper state of relaxation, um, get that brave, uh, get that brain, brave, get that brain into, you know, kind of more of the um, delta um, level in terms of those delta waves. Um, and then uh, the other tool that we'll use, this is kind of an old school ancient technology, if you want to call it, that is a sleep induction mat or an acupressure mat, 
laying on one of those. Um, again, talking about that hormetic response that you, you know, hormesis that you talked about, laying on a sleep induction mat, you're going to have about a five to seven minute window where you're not going to want to do it. You don't enjoy it because it's these plastic spikes that are laying on your back. But after about a seven minute window, once you get into about that 10 to 15 minute sweet spot, you'll find that the body starts to get into a far deeper state of relaxation. It's really kind of interesting. It's like this I don't know if you if it's like a reciprocal inhibition or whatnot, but you're stimulating acupressure points all along the back, and then all of a sudden you kind of get this little like spike of of kind of a, a, a an acute little like kind of mini stress response, and then all of a sudden the body just lets go and kind of melts. And I find that I sleep better when I lay on a sleep induction mat before. And, and I think um, sorry to shift gears just a little bit. I think we'd uh, be remiss not to talk about mitochondrial uh, function and brain health. Uh, yeah. mental, mental health and brain health has become the leading epidemic in the U S I think it's just taken over cancer and heart disease as the leading cause of disability in the U S and it's a huge problem. And, and now issues as, as our, you know, as we get older and parents and grandparents get older, we're seeing these massive rises in dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and these degenerative brain conditions, all of which have root cause issues in and metabolic and mitochondrial function yeah so sometimes we think of like just fatigue or brain fog which are you know both bad things but your brain is by far your most metabolically active organ i think it uses like metabolically a third. demanding yeah, yeah demanding so it uses like a third i think of your energy in your body which is huge and so as we're talking about energy atp production mitochondria and your brain using all this energy if you don't have enough energy and mitochondrial function, your brain's going to suffer. Not only short term, when we're thinking about um, mental uh, stamina, short term memory, long term memory, but literally the physical function of your brain. If your if your mitochondria can't clear out metabolic waste and and produce proper energy, your brain's going to deteriorate. And and it, and it does that. What they're finding now is the time in which the body does most of that metabolic waste dumping is during sleep. They're finding that this, like, sleep is brain detox is in essence what they're finding is one of the primary functions of deep sleep is your body's um, uh, cerebral spinal fluid gets pumped. There's a pumping action that's taking place where what it's doing is that pumping is literally, it's just like taking out the garbage every night. And if you're not getting into those deep sleep cycles, you're missing uh, basically a brain detox opportunity that's there. And so that's no doubt going to lead to some of long-term, you know, and again, they're, they're finding that unfortunately that people who have long-term sleep disturbances, insomnia are, I don't even know what the numbers are, but they're significantly at greater odds of dementia, Parkinson's and all that other stuff long-term. So getting that deep restorative sleep is basically your opportunity to detox your brain every night. Yeah, I, I love the idea of talking about the brain. It's without question, no pun intended, a hot topic. Number one, mitochondria, sauce brain. Number two is heart. Uh, most people don't realize the adverse effect of not feeding your brain with energy, whether it's just be food or like you say, a qualified mitochondrial function. So Andrew, you brought it up. Give me three things for my brain to function better tomorrow. I know oh, I probably need a lot podcast. more than that. I got that. Let's see. Listen to this podcast. Yeah, this Man, podcast here it comes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, you know, I, I really think I really think what Chad said, um, things that you can do daily that you know you're going to be compliant with that will move the needle. Sleep, big one. Uh, water, just making sure that you're hydrated is a big one. Um, and... Uh, I would say meditation personally, mm. I've, I've just noticed my, I keep going back to that because I just noticed like in as little as 10 to 15 minutes, and I would challenge anybody to do this. Um, it, it, and, and I think sometimes the unfortunate thing about meditation is that sometimes people can kind of either downplay it in terms of how powerful of a tool it really is. They, they kind of like, yeah, 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 deep breathing and all that. That'll make me feel a little better. Whatever. And I'm like, no, it'll completely change your physiology. Like in 10, 15 minutes, it'll, I mean, completely change your physiology. And the thing that excites me is that I think sometimes we keep, we, we think that like there's this massive firewall between us and our autonomic nervous system. 
oh, that's just stuff in the background that we have no control over, right? Our, our autonomic nervous system is going to do what it's going to do, what it's going to do. We have no control over that. And when you talk about things like breath work and or meditation, that is your kind of back door around the firewall, so to speak, to access directly and have conscious influence over your autonomic nervous system. And to me, that that's really exciting because what that says is you can have control over a lot of that. I mean, the, the, this is going to sound totally crazy. I mean, it's going to sound totally unbelievable. But if, if you disregard, don't believe me, you can read, read in the book. Uh, it's called Breath by James Nestor. He talks about it, how they're, they're like these monks who dedicate their lives to meditation and all this stuff. And they literally on command can consciously change the temperature in a single finger. So they'll be like, okay, my right first finger. I'm, and they've documented this where they'll like, they'll like, they'll, they'll take their temperature and then on command, they'll literally change the temperature in their finger, which sounds like nonsense. But for those who think that that's crazy, uh, Wim Hof did a study where he, they consciously fought off infections, like where they went to a hospital in Poland and they got injected with E. coli. And just by using breath work and or mindfulness meditation and or whatever their process was, they on command consciously fought it off. They commanded at will their immune system to fight off the infection, which is just wild, right? But my whole point, I don't want to get lost in this. Meditation can be something as simple as deep, slow breathing. Put in, This is what I do. I put in headphones. And I do a, a combination of a couple different things. Number one, I'll do just kind of your classic kind of what we call vanilla meditation, where you're just focusing on your breath, inhale and exhale. You're clearing your mind of all other distractions. Your mind will inevitably start to wander. That's okay. Don't get angry. Don't get frustrated. Don't get upset. You just circle, basically focus, refocus your mind back on the breathing, right? Over and over and over again. And what you're doing is you're literally exercising, quote unquote, the same uh, neurological pathways and reinforcing and strengthening those um, neurological connections that are involved with willpower, goal setting, goal keeping, discipline. You know, it's basically you're, you're 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 really solidifying and improving the functionality of your prefrontal cortex is what you're doing with that approach. The other approaches to meditation in general. Sometimes I'll do these exercises where one, where I, I call this expanding field meditation, where basically I start at like the nucleus, so to speak, the center. The mitochondria. The mitochondria focus. <laughs> the mitochondria. No, what I do is I focus on gratitude. And so what am I grateful for at the most intimate level? So for me being a spiritual person, I focus on God. And then from there, expand out to my family. And then from there, I'll expand to what am I grateful for in terms of my family? And then my relationships, my business relationships. And then like the people that I work with and get to serve and then the world and you just kind of expand from there and you're just focusing. And, and the key to that is the feeling. It's not, this is not an intellectual process. It's purely a feeling process because what's happening is if you really can feel quote unquote, the gratitude where you start to feel it, what you're, that's feeling this physiology, whether, you know what I mean? You, you feel good, you feel bad. Your biochemistry is changing in accordance with those feelings. The feelings are a symptom or a manifestation of biochemical changes taking place. People don't believe me. What you do is go sit in traffic in LA, you know, in a in a gridlock. And I promise you, if you did like a study taking blood pressure and or measuring cortisol and all these different stress hormones, you'd see that reflected in feelings. Our feelings are our biochemistry, right? It's nothing but blood being delivered to certain areas with certain special messengers, right? So going back to that whole meditation on gratitude gratitude i would say dare dare i say is perhaps the strongest positive healthiest emotion a human being can experience and feel love and or gratitude uh gratitude and or love and so it's you you bathe in that for 10 15 minutes solid of gratitude number one you'll notice a palpable difference in energy um and number two you'll just feel better throughout the day and so that's one of my favorite ones Third, last but not least, in terms of meditation, um, is I, I call this meditation um, kind of the end of your life meditation or whatever. And this is a powerful one, too, for me that I've done. And I try and do this pretty regularly on a weekly basis where what I will do is I'll clear my mind. I'll spend the first five minutes or so just kind of letting the dust settle, so to speak. And then for a good 10 to 15 minutes, what I'll do is I literally visualize I'm on my deathbed. And that might sound a little morbid to people. But it's really not. It's actually a really liberating and powerful meditation process. 
And what I'll do is, is what do I want to experience on my deathbed in terms of like, okay, we fast forward. It's the end of my life. I'm a nice, you know, healthy, ripe old age. I've lived a good life. What is the, what's that going to look like? And what do I want that to feel like? What am I grateful for that has already kind of transpired and what you're doing with this? And, and so then, you know, your, your loved ones are around, what are they saying? What are you feeling? What are they feeling? And, and again, it's this gratitude. It's, it's a different approach towards gratitude. But what happens is you're, you're literally tapping into your subconscious mind. And now we're starting to get a little bit into the metaphysical, but I'm okay with that because I'm okay. A lot of this has come in influence from uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza's work when you follow a lot of what he shares. And for some people I've talked to have mixed feelings like, oh, it's a little too out there, a little too woo. I eat it up. I think it's fantastic because I think a lot of his stuff is is very much validated by science and research. I think there are some stuff that we just can't quantify quite yet, but I think it's relatively all agreed upon, you know, that when we start tapping into the subconscious, pretty incredible things start to happen. And so for me, when I do that meditation, when you start doing this whole idea of dispensing with past, present, and future, and you just kind of, you know, visualize the future as the present, um, it, it wires things in a very unique and powerful way such that you set yourself up for some pretty miraculous things. And so that, that kind of end of life meditation, whatever you want to call it, I've found that to be profoundly impactful on my day to day to where when I do that in the morning, like it, it sets my day up in a very profound way. You start to be a lot more, I don't know if the right word to use is reverent, but a lot more reverent in terms of the way you look at life in general and your life. And you treat people different. I think you treat the present different. And so it, I think it just makes a huge difference. So meditation, sorry, I went off on a little tangent there, but I thought it was worth it. That was great. No, no, there's so much to unpack there. The, uh, the viewers are going to really be taking notes, um, profusely, interestingly enough. Um, my last, my last parting shot is how can these guys get in touch with you? Because you've definitely stimulated a lot of mitochondrial function in the brain. A lot of practitioners are going to be interested in how to implement functional medicine in their office and uh, online. And I know you guys have got a school. We talked about it a little at the beginning, but you know, in 30, 60 seconds, what can they get from you guys? Yeah. One of the hardest things when you're talking about all this information you share is how do you actually put it into practice, whether you're, you're someone looking to transform their own health or you're trying to do this for patients in practice. Uh, we help streamline these concepts into actionable steps that make it really simple to do. So we have a website, simplifiedfunctionalmedicine.com, where we talk about how to put all these things we just talked about into actual practice. Um, and so whether you're trying to, you know, build a successful practice and help lots of patients, or again, just your own life, that's, uh, that's what we do. Uh, we also have a podcast called the Simplified Functional Medicine Podcast, which talks all about these concepts in, in, in more detail. The, the other final plug too is that we are actually going to be hosting here in September a seminar in conjunction with Urconia called the Laser MBA program. And that's basically the, the business of implementing lasers into practice. So uh, this is going to be more practitioner facing and specifically, you know, those who uh, have been to Urconia seminars, probably yours, Dr. Silverman, um, have known that you guys are world class in terms of the CE side of things and the you know clinical education and all that fun stuff. Get inundated with just awesome, cutting edge science. Um, what the laser MBA is is it's okay. How do you actually take these lasers and make a profitable business from them? And that's what we teach in that laser MBA. That's going to be coming up September fifteenth and sixteenth in Philadelphia and or live stream. So outstanding. Well, it's been my pleasure, Docs. Hope to get you back on. We need part two. Keep up the good work. Stay in touch. My name is Dr. Rob Silverman. I'm with Dr. Chad Wilner and Dr. Andrew Wells, Proven Health Alternatives, always yours in health.